so we are live now uh, good evening everyone uh, this is show me and i welcome you to today's digital discussion uh, this session is a part of our larger project called forced migration under tmys review march 2022 that is up and running in collaboration with global south colloquium university of victoria under this theme of forced migration, we are currently calling for submissions in the form of essays, stories, and poems. To know more about the project architecture and submission guidelines, please visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz. Uh, this evening, I consider myself very privileged to be in the company of our esteemed panelists. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is children in the pandemic and the defeat of dreams. And to share their thoughts, we have with us Ms. Tabassum Barnagarwala, Mr. Saurav Taneja, and Professor Samina Hadi Tabassum. They are all experts in this area with many years of professional experience. Uh, before engaging with them in this discussion, I would like to take the opportunity to introduce our speakers to our audience here tonight. Uh, our first speaker tonight is Ms. Tabassum Barnagarwala, who covers public health and women and child development issues. She worked with the Indian Express for eight years before joining Scroll.in as a national health reporter in August this year. She was a year-long fellow with the International Center for Journalists to write on early childhood development. Her keen interest is writing on human rights, tribal and rural issues, and about social causes. She has won the Rich Lilly Award for tuberculosis reporting the SCARF Media Award and the Ramnath Goenka Award, Sanjeev Sinha Award for reporting. She was also a finalist in the Fetis of Journalism Awards 2020. Our second speaker in this discussion is Mr. Saurav Taneja, a Teach for India Fellow and a graduate of the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Saurav Taneja is CEO of the Akanksha Foundation, a non-profit organization with a mission to impact the lives of low-income children, enabling them to maximize their potential and transform their lives. He leads a team of 700 plus faculty and staff, close to 800 volunteers, all serving 27 schools that educate 10,000 children and a network of 4,000 Akanksha alumni across Mumbai and Pune. Last but not the least, we have Professor Samina Haditabassam, who is a clinical associate professor at Erickson Institute in Chicago, where she teaches courses on cognitive and language development. Her research focuses on issues of race, culture, and language. She has published a book on bilingual education and is finishing a book now on race relations in American public schools. She has taught in K-8 school settings for over 10 years as a classroom teacher and as a literary specialist. She worked with Teach for India from 2010 to 2015 and in the summers when her American graduate students worked with new TFI teachers in Mumbai, Delhi and Hyderabad. She has also published and gained recognition for her poetry and prose. Uh, so having introduced our speakers, now we would move on to engaging with our speakers and hearing their views and opinions on today's topic. Our first speaker, Tonight is Ms. Tavasam Nagarwala. Over to you, ma'am. Um, thank you so much for inviting me uh, for this panel discussion. Um, the topic that we are discussing today is a very sensitive issue. Uh, especially for me, it's a, very, it's a subject which is very close to my heart because I've spent almost li like last three, four months um, going and meeting families of children who've lost their parents, meeting their grandparents, guardians, and trying to understand what exactly is happening in India after the second wave has hit. So the figures that we already have in record are mind-boggling. Uh, we filed an RTI application in the Union uh, Ministry of Women and Child Development, and we found out that more than one lakh children had lost either their uh, mother or father or both parents. Of these, more than 92,000 children had lost a single parent, and about 8,161 children were orphaned. Uh, now, we need to understand that this is just the figure that the government has in record. Uh, in a country like India, where we know that the data management system is poor, there are thousands of more children who have not been recorded by the government, and they do not have any aid available. They, ha they are struggling with mental trauma as well as financial and education crisis, and there's very little support which is being provided to them. Uh, during the last few months, I traveled extensively in Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, and recently in Uttar Pradesh to get a sense of how 
uh, the spread of COVID-19 has been and how the kids have been affected by it. I would specifically first want to talk about the data which is available with us. Maharashtra in India leads with the maximum number of children who've been orphaned or who've lost their single parents. And then the data shows that uh, Gujarat follows with around 9,000 such children. Odisha follows with some 8,900 children. And then Andhra Pradesh comes with 7,514 children. Um, in Uttar Pradesh, when I visited, I met a lot of families where kids had lost their parents. But their parents were not tested for COVID-19, which effectively means that there have been people who've been dying because of COVID-19, who had symptoms similar to COVID-19, but they were never tested. So these people are never going to come in our system or in our records as COVID-19 fatalities. And their kids will never be um, eligible for uh, the, the different schemes that different governments have announced. Uh, from central government, which has announced um, 10 lakh rupees per child per orphan, to uh, different state governments that have announced from 1 lakh rupees, 2 lakh rupees to 5 lakh rupees for orphans. Uh, a lot of these kids whose parents have not been diagnosed before they died will not be entitled to these, these benefits, at least the financial benefits which are available. The second point that I realized during my reporting in the last few months was that even when they, these children are getting detected and recorded in the Women and Child Development Registry, what is happening is that the process is so tedious and it's such a lengthy process that by the time the aid will come to these kids, it will be of no use. Um, for example, uh, a lot of children will be entitled to receive some financial aid in a, in a means of it through a bank deposit, a fixed deposit, or through uh, government agencies when they turn 18 or when they turn 21. So I am meeting kids who are 10 year old, who are 11 year old, who've lost their parents at this point, and they'll be eligible for a financial aid after seven years. What do we do till then? How will these kids survive till then? There is nothing that the government has planned for these children to help them secure their present. A lot of kids are now opting out of private schools and they're moving into government schools or they're completely dropping out of school because they cannot afford education. So what we are seeing right now is this, this entangled web where uh, there are parents who've died, there is mental trauma that these kids are facing. Uh, there is no redressal of the mental trauma because that is still not considered a priority subject in India. So very little counseling which is happening in that respect. Very few states which are actively counseling. Then we have these kids who are uh, missing out on school, who are missing out on friends, uh, who, who are relying on guardians, in some cases, um, maternal uncles, maternal aunts, or paternal uncles and paternal aunts who are taking care of them. And there is currently no procedure in the government system where there is a quick prompt aid being provided to these kids. So I think what the system right now requires is a very quick mechanism where kids are identified, their papers are processed, their bank accounts are created. And the amount is immediately transferred every month into their account in whatever uh, schemes that the government has planned, either a fixed deposit or a monthly aid. This amount should immediately reach these kids because they need this money right now. They need education support right now. And if we help them after a few months, they will lose this, this crucial time. Uh, so I think a lot of states now need to uh, sort of gear and figure out how they can improve their system. Uh, the biggest problem that we are seeing right now is that we have a really understaffed WCD department. We have very few Anganwari workers. We have very few WCD officers. Uh, WCD officers are the ones who are in charge of uh, recording these kids, making their case files. In some states, it is called a special investigation report. And WCD officers are supposed to then take these children to the child welfare committees where a final decision is taken. In this entire process, we have gaps in the whole system where we are understaffed, the, a lot of posts are not filled, there's contractual staff, there's lack of regular staff. And because of which the whole process of giving aid to a kid is getting delayed. So I think the government needs to focus this right now. Politicians need to take this up as a priority issue, just like they've taken vaccination um, on their priority list. Only then can we expect to have some kind of help or aid uh, which will be provided to these kids. Um, so I would like to stop as of now. I think we'll continue uh, further in the panel discussion that comes. 
Thank you very much, ma'am, for sensitizing us to the gap that exists between data and reality and how children are the worst hit uh, um, in this pandemic. And so moving on to our next speaker for today, uh, we have Mr. Saurav Taneja. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Shami, for having me here today on the panel and really enlightening uh, insights shared by Tawassum as well. Heartbreaking more than anything else. Look, I'm an educator, so I would like to speak more from the vantage point of the impact of the prolonged school closure on our children. India is amongst the worst three countries across the world, perhaps after Nepal and Uganda, that has kept its schools closed for more than 18 months. That includes for primary children, elementary, early childhood education, everybody throughout. What has been the impact of that? Just to share a few statistics gathered from UNESCO and Azim Premji's study, the learning loss is projected to be double, so much so that it will possibly take 10 years to recover from that learning loss. That's the first and the most concerning part. Second, what has come to light in the past 18 months is the massive digital divide that exists in our country. Azim Premji University conducted a study that concluded that six out of 10 children in the country had absolutely no remote learning access throughout the school closure. Not one bit, uh, you know, and, and while I live in an urban region in Pune, We've seen the reality with our children in Mumbai and Pune as well, and have been deeply disturbed looking at how swiftly and quickly were some of the children who live across the street able to pivot to online learning. And, you know, at the policy level with tech investments booming like never before, you have millions of children who are completely slipping and falling through the cracks. I think the prolonged impact of the school closure has led to 50% increase in calls coming on child line, which is an indicator of the trauma and the well-being and the child safety issues that so many of the children have experienced. And there are about 24 million children that are at risk of never returning to schools. Can you imagine that? Uh, it is absolutely mind boggling that despite all the advocacy being propagated by UNICEF, World Bank, several educators, uh, even we have been a part of writing petitions to the government that, you know, even till today in Mumbai and Pune, the primary schools have not reopened for the past 20 months. Whereas when you contrast it with other countries in the world, there are countries that have adopted the philosophy of last to shut and first to open. The impact of the school closure is not just on academic learning. For several children, it is a safe space. It is a space from where they gain nutrition. It is the space where they form relationships. It is a space where they actually engage and it's a happy space for many of our children as well. You know, in all our engagement with our children online, if we have asked them what's the one big thing that they miss from their school environment, they mention it's their teachers and their friends. And just the impact of this, especially post the second wave of COVID, has been all the more drastic. While nobody is talking about it, it's because all other places are open and accessible to kids except the schools. They can access malls, parks, you know, or all the other places that you can imagine in the city, but not the schools. Last week, I had the opportunity to visit our schools where we are still able to bring in students in secondary grades, 8th, 9th, and 10th. And I saw these little ones loitering around outside the main building, 
and i as i walked in one of them held my kurta and asked me bhaiya please mujhe bhi le chalo na inside and and that's the travesty you know the children are hanging out outside the school premises and you have these security guards who are ushering ushering them away to not let them come inside the school campus uh so you know i think it is fairly demonstrated and poignant you know for as someone you know as idealistic as i was you know in in quitting a uh, a cushy job and thinking about making a difference i think the magnanimity of the challenge and how we treat education especially education for underprivileged in this country is perhaps at the bottom of the totem pole and and that's been something that's been visible and i am angered by it uh, uh you know it will take a lot more uh, of us to sort of roll up our sleeves to really you know do something about it and to really overcome these gaps if and when the government decides to reopen the schools so yeah i'm going to pause here uh and uh, uh you know allow my other fellow, fellow panelists to take over thank you uh, thank you very much sir for sharing your opinions on this uh it is heartbreaking to know how uh, opening of schools is still not a priority of our country and how digital gap that is more glaring than ever now is still unaddressed i hope things will improve in the recent times that's all we can hope uh moving on to our third panelist uh professor sabina hadita wasam it's over to you thank you thank you well i can say that this pandemic is a global pandemic it has affected everybody on this planet and what the basum and sorab have talked about have also occurred here in the united states we've had close to 800,000 deaths due to covid 140,000 children have lost a significant parent or family member to the virus and we're also seeing issues of schools being closed lack of digital access to schools issues of power who controls schools when they get to open and not open um but it has affected mostly people who are in the lowest socioeconomic bracket so here in the united states that includes mostly people who are brown latinx population and who come from the black community so you can see that there the adverse effects of this pandemic has greatly affected those who were already at risk before the pandemic came about um one of the things that i like to talk about is maslow's hierarchy i'm sure all of you are familiar with maslow's triangle of human psychology and if you look at that bottom layer of maslow's hierarchy it's physiological needs that children need ha have right the need for clean air the need for water for food for shelter for sleep for clothing all of that got disrupted because of the pandemic thinking about how children now weren't able to you know leave their tiny home and go out to school instead everyone was congested into small areas kids were on top of each other so there was a great greater likelihood of being infected um lack of access to food all of that gets disrupted right so we talk about how children need normalization children do well when there is structure when there is routines there is a predictable pattern to their life and so when that pattern gets disrupted what we what we say is children become co uh, dysregulated right that the sense of normalcy is gone and they don't know how to cope uh with abnormal schedules with things that don't work as they are usually planned and what's disheartening is here in the United States a lot of children ended up being at home with people who abuse them right people who sexually abuse them who physically abuse them um so for many children school was salvation it was a way out of the abuse that was occurring at home um some children came back to homes where there was no food right so looking at the idea that mal nutrition occurred as well and what will be the long term effects of that on their physical growth and health as well if you look at maslow's next you know hierarchy it's safety 
we all need to feel safe, a sense of personal security, um, our health, and also employment. And so all of that got disrupted during this pandemic. And you heard children say all the time, will I get sick? Will mother get sick? Will father get sick? Will somebody die? So this constant anxiety and worry and fear um, and depression around the pandemic itself and who will get sick and how will they get sick, right? The constant fear of, um, you know, not having a mask or having a mask and can I still get infected? The constant preoccupation that all of us have. Uh, the next level is love and belonging, right? So children need to feel love. They need friendships. They need family. They need connections. And so if you look at young children, they need secure attachments from age zero to eight with family members, right? With mother and father and siblings. But by the time they get to age eight, their sense of attachment is more with friendships. And so losing friendships losing friends it can greatly affect children who are in upper elementary and secondary. I can tell you, I was, we survived the pandemic. I had my three children here at home with me and we were all congested together in a very small space, but my children got sick of me and they got sick of my husband and they wanted to be with their friends. And so we try to provide safe opportunities for them to be outside and to be masked to be with their friends. Um, but they kept asking this question of, you know, mom, when will you get out of the house? Because I want to be with my friends. And then the next layer is esteem, right? Thinking about how do children get self-respect? How do they feel good about themselves, right? And school is often the, the way in which they get a sense of um, esteem. They go home and they tell their mother, oh, I did really well today in school. This is what I did, right? So they've lost that sense of esteem. And then the last layer of Maslow is self-actualization, this notion of, of mastery, of becoming very good at something. And so the research shows that children who grow up with great risk or who grew up in poverty, school is the great equalizer, right? So we know that when children gain cognitive skills and they become better problem solvers, or they become better readers, or they become better mathematicians, that sense of mastery is really, really important for their self-esteem, for their self-actualization. And so it also allows them to overcome poverty. My father grew up in Hyderabad, very, very poor. But by going through school, by getting a degree, he was able to overcome his poverty, right? And so we know that the cognitive gains that a child gets through schooling is going to be lifelong and it's going to impact the child and provide that sense of success regardless of the risks that are within that child's life. Um, so here in the United States, one of the things we talk about is risk and resilience, right? So children are at risk right now in the pandemic and they have lots of risks that they're facing from disease to neglect from families to dislocation to negative life circumstances. And you can see that it's affecting mental health. It's affecting how they're coping, right? So all of us have developed coping mechanisms during this pandemic. Some of us learned to cook at home. Some of us started knitting clothes. So what did children do? How did they cope? Do they have access to art? Do they have access to music? Do they dance? You know, what were the ways in which children learned to cope with the pandemic? Um, we also talk about how stress has a huge impact on children and how we're going to probably see what we call post-traumatic growth, right? So after this pandemic is over, um, we start at baseline zero. So Sorab was talking about all the missed schooling. So in some ways you can say, yes, it might take us 10 years for children to kind of normalize, right, in terms of academic growth. But another way to think about it is, once the pandemic is over, we're starting at baseline zero um, and starting over again and starting to look at where regression occurred, how many years behind our children and how what will it take to get them to move forward, right, and to move beyond that baseline of zero. Um, we also talk about how important it is to look at the effects of this pandemic over time, right? So some children might have been affected for a very short amount of time, while other children will see the effects that are chronic, that are lifelong. And so all of us have different individual reactions to this pandemic. And each child, even within the same family, will have a very different reaction to the kinds of stressors that are in their life. Um, 
the next thing to think about is how parents are the biggest mediators, right? Family members are the biggest mediators. So I'm looking at Sorab, right? So as his kids return back to school, there has to be a greater emphasis on teaching parents to become better mediators, right? So what kinds of intervention programs can we create to bring parents into the fold, to talk to parents about perseverance, how they can overcome the obstacles, to provide uh, ways for parents to protect their children um, through this pandemic, right? Um, but in the end, what I can tell you is that the pandemic is a human story. We have throughout human history faced so many risks like this. And what we know is that human beings can adapt. They can become resilient. They can overcome horrible life circumstances, right? And that is the story we need to tell our children the positive aspects of life and how they can thrive and how they're going to overcome this and how they're going to, you know, go back to their schools and how they're going to become better human beings in the long run. Right. So what kind of message do we adults then convey to children? And that positive psychology is so important right now um, to really keep telling children that, we're going to overcome this. We're going to become resilient. Um, we're going to gain that balance again in life um, that we're going to spring back. Right. And children are the most resilient. And um, we were talking about that at the start of this session and how amazing children are and how all of us have realized, wow, our children can adapt much better than we can as adults. Right. And so we know neurologically that children have what we call cognitive flexibility, they have the neurological ability to overcome circumstances at a much better rate than adults do. Um, and that's something I think we need to think about is really allow for children to show us and to demonstrate to us how they can become resilient. Um, and play, play is so important. The more children play, the more they socialize with each other, the better they're going to overcome the effects of this pandemic, allowing children to play, that's unstructured play, play for the sake of therapy, um, and allowing them to socialize with each other is really one of the best cures there are for the pandemic. But in the end, it is a human story. And I think when the children become adults, they will eventually mature and they will get over the effects of this pandemic. And they'll look back upon this pandemic and they'll look back upon um, the story of resilience that they will share with their future generation as well. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your insightful uh, comments. It was really very uh, enriching to know about this uh, because you addressed how racial discrimination has become a crucial factor with regard to it access to education and resources in the United States, how this pandemic has severely impacted children's mental health and how being away from school is also affecting the process of socialization, how children should adapt to the changes. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, so now after having addressed the, how the pandemic has taken a toll on children's lives in ways more than one, I would now like to ask our speakers some pertinent questions. Uh, my first question is to Ms. Bernagarola. Uh, she has addressed the issue of pandemic orphans. Uh, my question is that pandemic orphans have been weaned away from all certainties very early in their lives. How is this putting to jeopardy their growth and well-being? Along with that, do you think this trauma will outlive them and pass on to the next generation? Um. So, um, as Samira Ji said that, you know, children have a really good ability to forgive and forget quite quickly. I think if there is um, if there is good hand holding and there is timely counseling and we ensure that they, they're able to move forward, I think it is very easy for children to overcome the trauma of something as serious as losing their parents. So I don't think this would carry forward to the next generation if uh, we still have time if we handle it sens sensitively. But what is happening right now is, is not what we would expect um, to see. Uh, uh, politically, this is not a very important issue in India. Uh, we have more pressing issues. We have elections coming up. We have uh, uh, Omicron variant, which has come up, and we have vaccination. So those are the issues that are taking all the time of the, the IAS officers, the bureaucracy, and the politicians. Uh, I'll give you an example right now. I came across a child in Uttar Pradesh who um, had lost both his parents in the last one year in the first and the second wave both and there are three siblings 
now all three of them are not going to school they dropped out of school last year when the schools in uttar pradesh shut down and this year after their mother died their neighbors tried to admit them in a nearby school but the nearby school was not accommodating so it was it's a government school they said that you don't have enough documents uh, uh, it's already too late these kids are big they've lost one year and they're coming too late they've already started the session now if the school had admitted these kids the children would have a shot at a normal life right they would have played with kids in in the school they would have studies to keep them occupied they would their overall growth would have been um, if not at par at least there would have been some growth in these children but these children were not admitted in the school so now they'll have to wait for another year to seek admission so this is what uh, we are trying to explain that uh, you need to hand hold and ensure that you are immediately providing the right care which is required for children if that does not happen then there is the high likelihood that this would pass on to the next generation the trauma would continue with them as they grow into adults Now, what will also happen is that there will be a lack of confidence in these kids um, they do not have a parent figure in their life uh, they are relying on um, strangers and outsiders for their care and nurture very few kids have uh, i would say the luxury of a of a grandfather or a grandmother who is willing to take care of them and give them equal love that their parents could give so what we will be seeing is that if these kids don't get the attention right now their self confidence will deplete as they grow into adults and this will have a, a far reaching impact on the way they are employed the way they get on to their jobs the way they marry and then uh, you know continue with their life for the rest so i think uh, it will not continue in the coming generation if uh, there's timely intervention which right now we are not seeing Mm, thank you, ma'am, for addressing the uh, question because uh, this process of uh, socialization and coupled with that, how they are taken care of, can only ensure that they have a healthy life after this. Uh, our next question is that: uh, What role has the media played in sensitizing masses to the effects of digital gap that have become even more prominent uh, post-pandemic? How are the various agencies of the central and state governments working to reduce the digital gap? and ensure that school children are not deprived of their chances at getting education um, so i would say that um, if electro electronic media not to um, a great extent but yes print media and um, the the long form uh, digital portals which have long form articles they they have reported about this whole issue of digital gap that we are seeing uh, the problems that children are facing they do not have mobile phones if they have mobile phones in rural areas they do not have a uh, wifi uh, connection to access classrooms if they are able to access classrooms the teachers are not able to communicate with them um, because this is a new system for india we we never had online classes before uh, the way we are having now it is i think easier for uh, western countries the us or the uk because they are so digitally um, already adapted right we are we are still learning how to to grow with the digital technology so media has tried to play a role i would say there have been great reports from rural areas as well as semi urban areas where the issue of digital gap has been addressed but i think there is very little that the government can also do this requires a lot of infrastructure scale up right to provide children um, um devices so that they can access classrooms or to have villages equipped with wifi is something which requires a lot of investment and infrastructure upgradation which i don't think is happening as of now i will give you an example here in india the first village where which was completely digitally um, uh, upgraded was harisal it's a village uh, in amravati district of maharashtra now this this project was uh, back when the bjp government was um, uh, in charge in maharashtra and they had created a whole setup of wifi they had uh, pools that were uh, uh, equipped with computers uh, kids were taught how to use tablets the the primary healthcare center uh, center itself was um, equipped to have tele medicine services but in the next few years the contract for wifi was not renewed um, so the, there's the whole infrastructure standing there there is a room in the primary health center where you have computers for telemedicine but the telemedicine service is not working the schools have computers but the kids cannot go to the school because the schools are shut and the wifi which was there is now chargeable so a lot of villagers cannot afford to use the wifi 
so this whole digital village which which was such a uh, eye candy for maharashtra is now not working and this was a time when the digital village should actually have worked because this was when we required it to work because we wanted kids to study and so the kids there are not studying through uh, mobile phones or through tablets um they are they're staying at their home if a teacher comes in the village and tries to teach then the kids will assemble and they'll study but clearly they are not learning through the digital uh, india campaign that we hoped they would learn from thank you ma'am for addressing this question because uh, overall without overall infrastructural developments this a uh, digital gap can never be erased or at least uh, lessened uh, so my next questions are to mr tanija uh, my first question is in this time of a global disaster and distress how are ngos providing support to millions of children who are already taken care of by them and what changes are being made to the ngos infrastructural uh, facilities as well as economic resources to accommodate more children under their umbrella so i think the first one i have to say that uh, the whole ngo fraternity came together during the pandemic like never before uh you know i think it's just been heartening to see the kind of collaboration the exchange of ideas and practices in these last two years uh you know uh, this is my 10th year being a part of uh, the education sector and i think just the collaboration has been heartening and all of that has been in the service of children and communities at large so let me just share about three to four most relevant things that you know the non profits have stepped up to do where there has been a critical gap created due to the school closure i think the first and foremost has been like the was mentioned in trying to bridge the digital divide in whatever form and capacity that you could like even at akanksha foundation we managed to raise almost half a million dollars in a really short span of time to be able to provide internet as well as tablets to the children and this is not just akanksha many of the organizations have you know like really uh found creative ways in bringing used unused uh, devices into the hands of the kids uh you know whether it's rural india whether it's uh, uh outside uh, you, you know urban india so that's one like addressing the digital divide the second has been coming up with creative learning solutions that required minimal tech usage and i think that is pioneering innovation right i think the government's response was a lot rooted in television sets and you know like the uh, the you know the endless videos playing on loop i think some of the programs that the uh, ed- educators uh, from the non profits have imagined are just mind blowing right sesame street came up with a radio program uh, we ran uh, you know an on air storytelling Uh, for a period of four months, same was picked up by you know someone in rural Rajasthan. So there was just a bunch of ideas that were exchanged. There are WhatsApp-based assessments. There are WhatsApp-based lessons. Uh, parents are being engaged via WhatsApp wherever possible. Of course, uh, you know there are IVR-based solutions that have come up. So distance learning solutions that required low tech. especially for context of india were imagined and rolled out in double quick time which takes a lot of agility and innovation and ngos were sort of strapped for funding right like if you think about at the onset of 2020 that's second the third one that tabassum also mentioned is providing social emotional support for children who rely on schools to be able to do that many of our educators including akansha foundation we created a system for well being check ins with every single student where throughout the week you had to check in with your class 35 to 40 students five to six kids every single day not talking to them about math language science but really checking in on how are you doing where do you need help and really bringing the kids together online wherever possible to have like a joyful experience and i think that allowed us to address many of the you know concerns connected to counseling connected to sexual abuse 
relatively rapidly. And this is not just a cancer foundation. Several other organizations have, you know, figured out systems overnight to be able to ensure that children are kept safe as much as possible. And the fourth one, I believe, has been more connected to relief. Uh, I think it is underrated or, you know, not really spoken about just the mobilization of Russian and then now vaccine hesitancy that's been addressed in underprivileged communities by nonprofits, including schools, is just stellar and inspiring. Uh, you know, just the kind of places that they have managed to reach where, you know, the government stakeholders and authorities wouldn't dare to even dream. And I'm speaking about Mumbai and Pune, right? Like from our experience, you know, the last mile delivery here was was sort of carried forward by a cluster of nonprofits, right? So, so I think those are the four that come to my mind as how NGOs have stepped up during this time of the crisis. Uh, in terms of how are NGOs able to sort of, you know, improve and increase their infrastructure and economic, um, you know, stability. Look, you know, it's not been an easy time for NGOs in India at all. Uh, a lot of the corporate funding that used to fuel the India ecosystem was directed towards the Prime Minister's care fund. And a lot of the organizations had to go under the bus. They could not survive the shock of COVID along with not being able to have that. Some of the privileged ones, Akanksha Foundation being one of them, have stepped up to do whatever we can but it is very little in terms of the need that is there, right? Like we have expanded the capacity of our classrooms to accommodate 10% more students than we did last year, right? We had 35 students per division. We've now gone to 40 students per division. But, you know, like there are so many children out of schools right now. Affordable private schools have gone under the bus. So, you know, I wouldn't say that, you know, it's been feasible for NGOs to really ramp up their infrastructure and economic stability because... Uh, you know, on one hand, the local CSR norms got tightened and, you know, a lot of money got directed to PM Cares Fund. And on the other hand, like the government brought in really draconian interpretation of FCRA, you know, which is the Foreign uh, Currency uh, Revenues Act, uh, you know, which allows us to accept foreign funding. And we understand that there is a bunch of organizations that are doing it for unethical reasons or for, you know, religious and political reasons. But there are thousands of organizations that are genuinely serving the community, right? So, it, so it's been hard to be able to step up on infrastructure and uh, economic stability to be able to increase our outreach and impact. But the first commitment has been, what can we do for our children and communities wherever we serve to address the key gap that existed between, uh, you know, where the administration uh, couldn't step in, right? Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's where I would pause, Shaman. Uh, that was very insightful because we got to know how the NGOs are working. What we get to see uh, are just maybe 10% of the real facts because we don't get to know what is happening in reality. And uh, another question uh, that I have for you is that how has this pandemic resulted in a surge in cases of child abuse and harassment? Uh, how have they? Uh, how have children been more vulnerable to this? I think like I shared in my opening remarks, uh, Child 9 in the first nine months or so had reported 50% increase in calls, stress calls. And we have seen it in Akanksha as well that the number of children that we call at risk or vulnerable increased by 3x uh, prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic. And we were tracking every single student. So and at risk, you know, uh, has a spectrum. Sometimes the vulnerability was, uh, you know, varied. In some cases, the young adolescents and girls have been at risk of being married off or at the hands of uh, abuse. Uh, they've, they've had to migrate and go back to their villages where they are suppressed in a lot more active manner than they had they have ever experienced so they are at a risk of self-harm you know we've had about multiple cases where you know the girls have called us out of panic where they've wanted to commit suicide uh, 
only because of the pressure that they've been under, you know, because you've taken them from like a urban city life where they had a lot more freedom, you know, back into, you know, back to their towns and villages. So that's second kind of vulnerability. And the third is just loss of connection and a sense of belonging, which has just, you know, caused a lot of trauma amongst children, especially the younger ones who struggle to stay connected online, who struggle to navigate, uh, you know, Zoom and WhatsApp learning and Google Meets. And, you know, uh, it's been a difficult time for them. So, you know, while I totally resonate with Samina that children are resilient, uh, you know, and without appropriate strategy and support that has to be prioritized if and when the schools reopen, I say that again and again, uh, you know, I do think that this is going to be like a life, uh, you know, uh, lifetime sort of an adverse impact, right? So we we require greater investments in counseling, in family engagement, uh, you know, going forward and all schools need to be equipped. Unfortunately, the government had also cut the education budget, right? Overall, if you see the investments went down. So, so you know, to be able to combat all of this uh, adverse impact on social emotional health of children, at every school, every teacher will need to become and don the hat of uh, a counselor as well, and not just a math or a language teacher, right? So you have to combine those skills and we need to upskill them uh, in really being able to reorient their mindset towards social emotional development and creating safe spaces for children. We reopened schools partially for 8th, 9th and 10th grade. The first week, we were we had gut-wrenching hearing experiences in our circle time where the kids shared the kind of experiences that they've gone through, uh, you know, the kind of abuse that they've experienced during the time that they've stayed away from school. And it you need to be able to create those, you know, safe spaces, uh, you know, and not shy away from them because of how overwhelming they can they can be because it can be incredibly powerful and safe for a, for a student to confide in front of 25 other peers as well as a caring adult right so 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 i think like it has to be a mix of how much has happened and how much needs to be done going forward while you talked about how students have uh, narrated their experiences their traumatic experiences at home it's just horrible to think of how many children are still going through this who are still away from school and uh, their schools might not open anytime soon with a new uh, variant coming in so it's just a disastrous situation uh, thank you for your comments sir and uh, my next questions are to uh, professor Hadi Tabassam uh, ma'am uh, with regard to the varying degrees in which the pandemic has impacted children's lives, uh, do you think class differences have played a major role in this? And if so, how has that played a major role? Thank you. Um, I want to respond back to some of the earlier comments as well. So both of our countries spent millions of dollars trying to put a device in front of a child's hand. We know through research, children do not learn from audio and video technology. They only learn from a human being. You need to have a human being in front of a child who will look the child in the eye and have a conversation. Look at human evolution. For hundreds of thousands of years, that is how children have learned through another adult human being teaching that child. So why are we even putting effort in putting a screen in front of a child? A five-year-old child can sit in front of a screen for maybe eight minutes. That's it. You know, and then how do you expect a child to fit in front of a screen for eight hours? That's ridiculous. Um, the other situations that you saw is not only access to devices, but also thinking about the level of parenting support, right? So even myself, I had three children on online devices, but I was working too. So I was not able to sit next to my son, you know, if the teacher's asking a math question and they're online and I cannot sit next to my son and go, you sit, this is the answer. This is what you need to do. This is what your teacher's asking you, right? So the privileged children had access to parents who sat next to them and who helped them and supported them and provided the scaffolding that they needed to do well in even an online scenario. I, on the other hand, even as highly educated as I am, my children were in the other room 
and I would hear their Zoom session. I'd be like, "Are you sab hat utha kuch bolo, teacher tumhare se mangra kuch bolo na." So then here's me yelling at Hindi in Hindi across the room to my own children because I could not support them. I could not sit next to them because I was working. So how am I supposed to work and also support my three children who are on Zoom for eight hours a day? That's ridiculous, right? And there are days when I told my children, you're not going to school. We're going to shut down the iPad. We're going to go outside. We're going to do something other than being on Zoom for eight hours. So I think it's all ridiculous. I also think, why did we not use science and history? All of these schools should have been outside. We know through the research that the virus spreads through indoor, poorly ventilated spaces. So we should have said, you know what? Children can't get the virus outside. Let's space kids apart, six feet apart. Let's have school outside, especially in a place like India where it's temperate. Here in Chicago, you know, we face worse weather. The question is, why didn't somebody take the initiative to say schooling shouldn't stop? and that we need to just use a much more creative solution, which we have been using for hundreds and thousands of years, schooling outside under a tree with kids six feet apart. Uh, so yeah, all of these issues, if we go back and put the, if we rewind time, we should know better, right? And we should have done better to our students and our children by really looking for a solution that had worked throughout human history. And why did we not go? We kept pushing these digital divides and kept trying to put a device in front of a child. And that's not be the best solution. That's not how children learn at all in front of a computer for eight hours, right? Um, we also know that the devices didn't always work. The Wi-Fi didn't work. Um, the devices were old. And so here, even in Chicago, there was huge digital divide. And what happened is the administrator started knocking on doors and said, hello, are you there? Uh, do you need a device? Um, and people donated device. But here's this thing. Even when the child had a device, they didn't want to go to school. They didn't want to be online for eight hours a day. And so a lot of children just checked out. They disappeared right out of the system. We lost them. We don't know what happened to them. Um, and some of it is because children do not learn in front of a computer right? Basic situation. Those children should have been outside. They should have been playing. They should have had half day school outside and made it possible for them to socialize with each other and to learn in a ventilated outside type of school setting. So all of the things if we regret, right? If we could push the clock back all the ways and we should have thought of better creative solutions than the digital divide, which I thought was nonsense. Yes, ma'am, I absolutely concur with what you said. Uh, it's really needed for us to reassess the solutions that we are looking for. Instead of addressing digital gap and digital divide, we should look for ways that are more sustainable and that can bring back children to the education and learning process. Uh, another question I have for you is that the first few years of a child's life is very important as the formative years, as the years in which a child forms its identity. So how do you think uh, this uh, period of being cooked up at home, this period of incarceration in so many ways is affecting their identity formation as a whole and their social health as well? Immensely affecting their identity, right? Because one of the biggest things is the child needs to feel self-esteem, self-actualization and understanding of who they are, right? And that's in relation to their peers and in relation to their community. What I can say, going back to what the Tabassum had said earlier, the age matters, right? So if I lost a parent and I'm three years old, most likely I can overcome the trauma of a lost parent, right, and being an orphan. But once a child hits puberty, those are the most troubling populations, right? Adolescents are the ones that are most troubled. So going back to Sorab's question of suicidal tendencies, self-harm, um, uh, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, right? Violence and aggression. Those are the kinds of long-term chronic effects that this pandemic will have. So the most vulnerable are the most adolescents, right? And in, I can tell you in Indian society, you know, we don't look at adolescence as a construct. We don't really see adolescence as an age when you need to focus on your child, right? Uh, we focus on that young child when in fact the young child will probably not have memories of their parent dying at age three. It's that 13-year-old child who will be permanently affected 
by the trauma of being an orphan. Um, so those are some things that I think is really important to, to realize. I watched a movie with Sri Devi and she said something very poignant in that movie. She said, right? who are these children? Focus on figuring out who they are rather than trying to teach them to become somebody, right? Um, so I think those are huge cultural things that we need to look at is um, look at the most vulnerable populations, look at how children gain a sense of identity. They gain it uh, through their culture. At the same time, I must say that, I don't know if you're seeing this, that a lot of children are gaining resilience through their cultural world, right? Through God, through faith, through religion, um, through practices in which they're staying connected. I rem remember reading here in Chicago about how the Indian wedding must go on even when there's a pandemic. And I think it's because human beings want to continue those cultural norms of behavior because it's a big part of who they are in terms of their identity, right? So we know that um, the pandemic affected cultural norms, things that we do all the time have been disrupted. And then by not having those cultural norms, it affects your identity, right? If you can't have Eid and celebrate Eid with all of your family members, then that there's a sense of who am I, what am I, and where am I going? And so all of those questions, I think, are really essential. But I definitely think we need to focus on our adolescents and our teens as we come out of this pandemic. Thank you, ma'am, for giving such a lengthy and clear answer and your perspective on how we should deal with adolescents and their mental health uh, and through this process of identity creation. And so with this, we bring this session to an end. Uh, thank you very much, panelists, for being here with us, for giving us your time. Uh, we could discuss how the pandemic has measured out the length and breadth of human lives, leaving children even more vulnerable to its repercussions. Uh, it was a very enriching session. Uh, thank you again. And with this, uh, we conclude today's session. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank you.